Today's episode, we're going to take you guys through the step-by-step -step process of how we do our food plots, starting at frost seeding and going all the way to our fall food plots. And we're going to throw in some tips and trips, tricks along the way, whether you have a place to plant food plots or not, this episode is going to be for you. Okay, it's February 26, 2016. Uh, out here, going to frost seed some clover. As you can see, we got some snow on. It's going to be 50 degrees tomorrow. Uh, this plot right here, uh, basically I had soybeans down here, used that for site preparation. So it used to be fescue, uh, old horse pasture. So we had our soybeans down here, we were able to spray it with glyphosate several times. Uh, so we have a nice seed bed to start with, I mean it's just soybean stalks and bare dirt. So uh, we're going to be seeding in clover and then just a cover crop or a nurse crop of uh, oats. A uh, couple advantages to frost seeding. Number one, when you're spreading your seed, you can see where you're going. Uh, and you can also see what kind of spacing you're get, getting for seeds on the ground. Works real well with uh, small seeded species like clover. Basically, you want to do it <clears throat> while you have snow on because when the snow melts, the seeds are going to find the crevices that the water's draining down into, and basically the snow is going to plant the seeds. Uh, the, you know, clover is something you don't want to get more than a quarter inch deep, so great method for that. Uh, another advantage to frost seeding is the early start. So basically, your seeds they'll kind of take in water uh, through their seed coat and swell up so when that first germination day is here those seeds are ready to germinate you're giving them more time to develop and take advantage of a wet spring uh, so that's two advantages to frost seeding and uh, something to do right now guys and soybeans are perfect just follow your clover with your soybeans uh, make sure you get a soil test I'm actually gonna spread some wood ash out here a little later I've got some up at the house this needs the, the pH needs to come up a little bit out here and wood ash is 48% calcium and it's got a lot of micronutrients so that's the plan. To go a little further in depth on what Jacob just said, you know frost seeding is probably one of our favorite ways to start a new clover food plot. Just for the fact that when the ground starts freezing and thawing, it's basically planting itself. So basically that's usually here in Illinois, that's around the end of February or so. And what we like about that is you get good seed to soil contact, the weeds are pretty much all dead, and then when spring comes, it's usually the first thing to pop up before the actual weeds start to germinate. So therefore, clover is getting a head start on the weeds. And we like to plant the perennials just for the fact the following year we come back, and you'll hear a lot of people say, plant as much, if not more, when you frost seed. I found that personally to be false. I actually use probably half or maybe even a quarter of when I do my original first planting. The reason being is when you come in to frost seed, say after the plot is already established, you'll come in and fill in those gaps, those bare spot gaps where the clover didn't come up very good. And that's really all you're doing. There's no sense in overseeding on top of your already clover that's there. So you're just trying to fill in those gaps. And like I said, when that ground starts freezing and thawing, it's going to go into the soil and it's basically planting itself. So it's a very easy way to do it. A hand spreader, you can use an ATV spreader, whatever you got, a uh, very cheap way to do it. Uh, it just takes a little bit of labor. So it's summertime now, and you've put in all that hard work and labor earlier this spring. You got this awesome looking clover plot that came up. This is a first year, real world's uh, clover and chicory blend I've got here. So now you're just gonna sit back and wait for deer season to come around, right? Well, not me. I'm out here mowing, spraying, keeping these things down, keeping them short 
keeping the weeds off of them. I usually try and mow them. I may mow four, five, six times a season. Uh, just keep this clover plot down around five, six inches. You're just taking the, the white seed heads off the top of the plants, basically. I try not to let mine get over about 10 or 12 inches. If I start getting a lot of other weed pressure, then I come in and I spray it. I usually use Post. There's a lot of other products out there you can use. Some of them have a surfactant mixed in, some of them don't. Um, if they don't have one, I recommend adding some in or just using vegetable oil or whatever you've got. Um, kind of keeps the product on there, makes it work a little bit better, keeps it sticky all day long, and, and it'll kill off the stuff you don't want in that plot. Um, do those things and you're going to have a great looking plot for many years. Benefit all the wildlife, not just the deer, but everything else that's out here. And those are a few tips for you and things you can be doing all summer long to benefit your properties. All right, with all the rage about food plots today, there's some people like myself that don't necessarily have the luxury of planting food plots, whether you don't have the space or the time or anything like that, to where I resort to timber stand improvements. And that way you can kind of resort to the woods having more food for your deer because you can't plant a food plot. Um, an example is releasing your oaks. After you get rid of your invasives like your honeysuckle and your rose, you can go in there and you can cut out the less desirable trees, say the locusts, the maples, um, the elms, any undesirable tree. That way you release and create more sunlight into the forest floor, creating more browse for your deer and upping your mass production for your acorns and your hickories. Some people that I've come in contact with, they, they get TSI, which is timber stand improvement, and they get hinge cutting kind of confused, where hinge cutting is to me, if you want to create a bedding area and you want it in a specific place, you cut that tree where it's, it fell down, but it's still attached to the base, to where TSI, you're gonna come in and you're gonna take out say this locust and this maple behind me to release this oak to open up the canopy so more sunlight hits the forest floor and you're getting more browse and more oak hickory regeneration. So that is improving your whole timber stand where hinge cutting is more for deer bedding and some deer browse in the meantime. As you can kind of see it's 10 o'clock in the morning and there is little to no sunlight hitting the forest floor behind me. All these maples about that big around are shading out the forest floor, taking over the understory to where it's limiting the light getting through that is not creating the brows you need or the oak regeneration. So taking out these maples, that'll open up the canopy, releasing sunlight to the forest floor, creating more brows and more oak regeneration for your deer and your forest to come. The major question this week is why do we plant food plots? Well, for us, first and foremost, it is to provide all wildlife with nutrition. And we try to do that all year round. Also, we want to make our property stand out as different and more attractive than the neighboring properties. So I'm going to go ahead and touch on planting fruit trees and the different aspects and the importance of providing food plots and nutrition all year round. I'm going to go ahead and try and cover fruit trees as fastly as I can, but in reality, we could have an entire episode strictly on this topic. First off, we like to choose trees that are going to ripen and mature during the season. You know, we don't just go to the local farm and home and just pick up any type of apple tree. You need to do your research and look at when that tree truly matures. And also, you need to make sure that they're cedar rust resistant. Basically, with the fruit trees that we provide, we can have fruit dropping from July all the way through February. You know, we're looking at having a constant drop for several months. We're not just planting one variety of fruit trees that is dropping fruit this week, the deer come in and demolish it, and then they have no reason to come back to this plot. You also want to have a variety. Apple, pear, persimmon, crab apple, chestnut. You know, those are our, our primary, our most common fruit trees. Um, but with that, you know, certain ones are more for pollination, some are early season, some are late season, but as a whole, you're providing deer with nutrition for several months. You're providing all wildlife with nutrition for several months. When it comes to planting fruit trees, it comes with a lot of planning. You don't want to just throw them out in the middle of nowhere. You need to think ahead, do a lot of research, and come up with an overall game plan so that you have nutrition and fruit as soon as possible. 
you know you really only want to do it one once instead of taking shortcuts and having to replant multiple times we're always planning about six months ahead what we're doing this fall is going to affect what we're doing next spring and vice versa it's it's there's something to do all year round basically anywhere that we're going to be putting fruit trees we suggest having the real world clover chicory blend underneath not only does clover add nitrogen back into the soil which is in return helping the fruit trees but you're also double cropping the deer are coming here for the clover and chicory along with the fruit all wildlife is coming here for these things as well a lot of times whenever we are planning where a fruit orchard is going to go we're going to plant soybeans or plot topper there the fall prior so whenever we come in uh, late February or early spring we can just frost seed the clover straight in and then come through and plant the fruit trees as well and that's going to give you good seed to soil contact it's going to give you a nice area that's already been worked up when it comes to maintenance with fruit trees it's just like anything else the more time and effort you put into it the faster you're going to see the benefits fruit trees are typically going to take three to five years to start producing in the first place so you're going to want to do all your first steps correct so you're not waiting six to ten years before you ever start seeing fruit a few quick things um, with the maintenance would be roundup spraying a three or four foot circle around each tree uh, to eliminate any weed competition. If you plant it in a nice clover buffer or a clover orchard like this, you know, you wouldn't have to necessarily spray around it. But if you plant your trees along a, a fence row or a waterway and it's just solid fescue, you want to eliminate as much weed competition as possible. Another very important uh, aspect are the tree shelter tubes. Not only does that prevent the deer from rubbing them on the, in the fall, but it also serves as basically a greenhouse effect and it, it holds condensation in there in the mornings and it's all, almost a self-watering system. Another important thing is to mulch. A lot of people don't go the extra mile to mulch their trees, but mulch is gonna retain moisture and it's gonna help those trees survive through those hot summer months. You'll also notice a lot of the trees will be eaten up with uh, pests. So, we like to go through several times throughout the summer and spray with seven dust. Seven dust will kill a hundred plus different types of insects and pests and, and that's gonna help keep your trees from stressing. Another thing during the hot summer months, we like to go through if it hasn't rained, which typically here in Illinois, that's what happens. We have to go through with a bulk water tank and water each tree individually if we haven't had an, enough water throughout the summer. It's all the little things that eventually add up on whether or not you're going to have a successful, nutritious plot that all wildlife can uh, benefit from. To sum up planting fruit trees, the more time and effort you put into it, the faster you're going to have fruit producing. Now I've tried to condense as much information into these few short minutes as possible, but I know I didn't go into as much detail as I wanted, and I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions now. So email us at Team Radical. Send us messages on Facebook, or if you want to speak with Steve or myself with wildlifemanagementtrees.com, we'd be more than happy to help you and answer any of those questions you might have. Um, lastly, a simple question to ask yourself, now and each season in the future, which side of the fence is greener, and what are you willing to do about it? This is one of my favorite food plots on the entire farm. I love soybeans. These are from Real World. Uh, Real World recommends that you plant 140 seeds to the acre. Um, I usually bump mine up a little bit higher. The way I do it, I take my planter, which is a four row, wide row planter, and I set it for about 40,000 seeds to the acre. Essentially what I want to end up with by the end of the spring is four passes across here. Sometimes I'll do two rows side by side, then I'll come back in, do one crossways, do one at an angle, whatever. If I end up with a little spot in the field where kind of like right here where you can see um, somewhere that they either didn't emerge or possibly the deer just came right down the road and picked them. I come in later, then those angled plants, they're gonna come in, they're gonna fill in. This I planted about two or three weeks later after the other ones were coming up. What that did is it let them browse the other plants for a little bit, then, then the new ones, they came in, filled in. Uh, another nice benefit, those angled rows or those cross rows, they make it a lot harder for the deer to walk down. You just try walking through this plot once it gets taller and you're tripping all over your feet. Same thing for the deer. 
when it's not as easy to walk straight down the middle, they're not going to browse your plot as hard, and uh, you'll have a lot better chance of getting a nice even stand. And then in the fall, you're going to have a lot better food plot that'll benefit all wildlife, deer, turkey, quail, pheasants. You'll see all kinds of animals in here browsing come this winter. So just a few little tips I like to use and, and things that might help you out when you go to plant that food plot this year. Well, I can sit here all day and talk about soybeans because they're pretty much my favorite food plot. And it's because it provides for so much wildlife, it's not even funny. Especially here in Illinois, the late season, in the winter months, we get the snow and uh, ice storms. You know, we get some crazy weather and literally there's nothing for the animals to feed on other than the soybeans. And there's been numerous times, how many times we've filmed deer, turkey, pheasant, quail all over in our soybeans eating them. Now the important part about the soybeans we plant, which is the real world soybeans, is they're the most shatter tolerant soybeans there are on the market. And thankfully, they were nice enough to do hundreds of tests on different varieties of soybeans to find the most shatter resistant soybeans on the market and they bagged them. Now th these soybeans also have a different maturity rate. So one's gonna start turning yellow and then brown sooner than the next one, say, that stays green. So there's three different varieties in this bag. And it really helps out for the, the one, the browsing pressure, and then also giving you some green leaves come into season, which is nice and the deer do love that. But our main focus is to have the food plot, the soybeans, stand all throughout the entire season, not shattering from them pods. Those soybeans shatter out of those pods that fall on the ground, when that ground freezes, it's pointless. It does no good. The deer, the turkey, all of them, they can't get to it because it's frozen to the ground. So that's why we rely on the real world soybeans. Now when it comes to planting soybeans, there's no really right or wrong way to do it. It's pretty simple, honestly. You can either use a ATV spreader, hand spreader, you can use a drill, you can use a regular planter. It, they're extremely easy to plant. Basically you're trying to get, you know, just barely in the ground. And if you do plant it with a broadcaster, I recommend you drag over the top. If you don't or can't, I wouldn't worry about it. You'll probably still get a good stand. Now the soybeans we plant are Roundup ready, so therefore we obviously spray Roundup on them. And it's imperative to keep the weed pressure down so the soybeans can get the optimal growth that they need and get as high as tall as they can and get as many pods as they can. That is the goal, just like any other farmer would do. So when's the best time to plant soybeans? Well, that all depends on the weather and when your farmer plants their soybeans. You know, we have found that after farmers have planted their soybeans, we like to wait at least two weeks after they plant theirs. So that way when their soybeans start coming up, the deer, the deer and the wildlife is gonna go attack their young tender plants first while ours is coming up and being able to get established before they even know that those soybeans are there. So we try to wait at least two weeks. So typically that'll put us somewhere in around June and we'll plant all the way from June 1st all the way even into July. And we've had no problem and had just as good a stand as if you would plant them in May. So that all depends on your area and the timing of year to plant. But we do recommend, like I said, planting at least a couple weeks after your farmer has planted theirs. That will help you on the browsing pressure on your soybeans. Fall food plot wise, I gotta say plot topper is one of my favorites and it's one of those that comes in a small jug that it'll go a half acre and you can either mix it with something like harvest salad which will plant an acre or you can use a filler like fertilizer or lime that way it's a lot easier to plant that half acre because the seed's so small in that plot topper that you almost need a filler to get that evenly spread out throughout your plot and what's in plot topper it's sugar beets turnips radishes rape and two kinds of brassicas and Basically, I like to use it as a sole plot, but also if you have a bean field and you're a terrible farmer like myself, you can cover up your mistakes and you can broadcast that in with your beans and it kind of serves as a double plot in itself. It's kind of the do-all of the fall food plots because you can cover up your mistakes that you made in the spring or you can just start over and create a new food plot in the fall. It's really up to you. If you don't have a, a big area to plant a soybean food plot, and you have the deer densities like I do, they annihilate those beans in the spring and summer months to where I really have nothing left come season. That's why plot topper is a good way to kind of have a filler into that bean field because it's not a lost cause to plant beans in a smaller food plot because you provided that nutrition and that food for them for the growing months in the spring and summer to where in the fall you can come in that same food plot. You've already knocked out the weeds and you got a good soil, you can have good soil contact with your plot topper just go in there and broadcast it right before rain. We typically plant our plot topper 
within the first week of August to the first week of September, depending on the forecast. So if your soybean food plot gets demolished, it's not a lost cause, check out some Plot Topper. Quickly becoming one of my favorite food plots is the Harvest Salad by Real World Wildlife Product. Now this is a fall food plot that is planted, they recommend the beginning of September, so that way your weed will come back the following spring. But if you're not concerned about your wheat coming back the following spring and you know you have plenty to provide for the wildlife at that time, like myself, I like to plant it around the beginning of August or the second week of August to optimize the growth of the, of the food plot. Now it's imperative that you base this on mother nature. If you don't have a rain in the forecast, a for sure rain in the forecast, I recommend you don't plant it. If that seed lays there for too long of a period of time, you're gonna have a very poor germination rate if you don't get any rain. Plant harvest salad, you need to make sure you have a good seed bed. You need to have a clean, weed-free seed bed, whether you disc it up, you kill it all off with Roundup, whatever it might be. But typically what we like to do is disc it up and then broadcast, hand broadcast the seed into the seed bed. One of my favorite things to do with the harvest salad is to put it right on the edge of my big soybean food plot. And what this does is it eliminates a lot of pressure on my soybeans. Typically the deer will go from greens to beans. And usually they'll hit the harvest salad first, which can withstand a lot, a lot of pressure. And then they'll head into the soybeans. So this will not only be a really good food source for the deer, it'll also help eliminate the pressure on your soybeans. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. You know, we could sit here all day talking food plots. We could probably make an entire DVD talking about it and things that we've tried that doesn't work, things that we tried that does work. And everything that we put in this show here today is things that we found definitely to work and everything is obviously going to depend on your area where you're located what state uh, your soil type and all that and that's for you to do your research and to find out but these are the products that have worked for us and you know we're constantly learning we're always trying new things and we feel that's the best way to provide for the wildlife we don't want to plant something that the wildlife is not going to like or benefit from the ultimate goal like I said at the beginning of the show is to provide for all wildlife so we hope you enjoyed the show. If you guys have any questions at all, leave them in the comments and we'll do the best to answer them. Thanks for watching.